is full of stories. Stories of mysteries, of curiosities, of oddities. Join Cat and Jethro Gilligan Toth for the strange, the bizarre, the unexpected, as they lift the lid and cautiously peer inside the box of oddities. Freaks, what are you doing in our house? So weird. We don't have enough beer. Uh, sorry for all of you. Yeah. Um, we're so glad you joined us uh, this evening. This is our very first virtual live from the partially furnished basement tour. Partially finished basement. Partially finished and furnished. Somewhat furnished. Yeah. Well, it's got a bean bag. That's really about it. It's a really nice bean bag, though. I mean, don't belittle the bean bag. That's true. Normally when we do a live show, we, you know, something weird always happens. Uh, like when we were in Bridgeport, Connecticut, we did the show there. Um, we had all kinds of issues driving through Boston, but we are in our house. So we don't really have a story. Um, boy, that traffic in the kitchen was rough. Right. The refrigerator was running. Whew. Yeah. Um, Acting like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. We're looking forward to getting out and doing real live shows, but it looks like at this point it's probably not going to be until sometime next year, maybe late springish. I, I I really don't know. But don't guess. Yeah. It's don't guess because wa- we're going to be wrong. I want <laughs> we we often are. <laughs> when we were in Connecticut, we wore masks because at the time it was funny. Yeah. It was like ha ah, ha. Yeah. Masks because pandemic, right? Yeah, and then a pandemic hit. Yeah, we didn't think that one through. No. No. Um, But we're so glad that even though we can't come out there to you, that you come in here to us. Yeah. Uh, We'll give you a little sample of what it's like to be at one of our live shows. Uh, The main main difference is the fact that... uh, you know, you don't see my DVD collection over here on the wall. Yeah, right there is my treadmill. Yeah, there's a shot of her treadmill. Can we get a shot of her treadmill? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, hopefully you will uh, enjoy this. Uh, we certainly are planning on enjoying this because we miss getting out and doing these live shows. And uh, hopefully it won't be too long. We did have a couple of shows that were not successfully recorded. Um, so we are very fortunate to not have to work to get these stories ready for you. Yes. Yes. These are stories that we have done at other live shows. My story I did uh, in the Washington DC show and yours is from San Francisco, San Francisco. So this is going to be kind of a sample of what, uh, what the live shows um, are like. Also, we're very excited that the curator is making uh, a couple of appearances here uh, during the, uh, the, uh, the the broadcast, and if you will. As you have noticed, our road manager, Amber, is on board as well. So uh, thank you to the audience uh, yeah. for being here Woo-hoo. today. Woo-hoo. We've got uh, Amber and Ryan and Ban- guinea pigs. Banjo and yeah, we. that's it really. There. Not much of a... Of a um, yeah. Of an audience. I but, mean, wow, right, guys? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we pull in a crowd. Hey, we're sold out, really. I don't I think it's the first time we've sold out our partially finished basement. Furnished, Great job. Furnished or finished? No, finished. All right. Well done. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I will go first if that's okay with you. Please do. All right. This is my Washington DC story, and I can't get my Kindle on. All right, there we go. Is that your new one? Yes, it is. Um, so we have this fun relationship habit where um, a special holiday is coming up, and uh, he will buy himself the thing that I've yeah. just purchased for yeah. his birthday or Christmas it's or true. whatever. It's, it's true. She yeah. thinks it's just a coincidence, but I go into her Amazon account, and I look and see what she's buying for me, and then I wait a day or two, and then I buy it for myself. It's fun. You guys ought to try that sometime. Okay. Um, Anyway, Washington, D.C. This is where we were when I did this story. And I was talking about uh, the the nation's capital being under attack. We're being invaded. It's true. Yes. It is true. In 2002, a fisherman in a pond behind a strip mall 
in Crofton, Maryland, caught a long, skinny fish, about 18, 18 inches from end to end. Um, he didn't know what it was. Took a picture of it and uh, threw it back into the pond. The uh, photographer, or the photograph of the fish, was sent to the Wildlife Service and um, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, uh, to be more specific. And an agency biologist emailed the picture to fish experts, and they said... I want to be a fish expert. (laughs) How does one become a fish expert? I don't know. I don't even know. Like, I'm sure a lot of different paths could lead you to being a fish expert, and I don't care about any of those. I just want, like, a little... Like a little name yeah, plaque. Yeah, sure. Do you start out as an amateur and work your way up to the pro tour? Well, I don't know. I mean, you if you're in the pros, can you go to the Olympics? If they have a fishing competition, perhaps. <laughs> um, what they found out was this fish was a fucking snakehead. I don't know what that yeah. means. Okay, a snakehead. Well, you do because I did this story once before. I know. I don't listen, though. <laughs> That is true. Um, a snakehead. It's um, it's a really ugly fish. It's very muscular. Rude. It has King rude. huge teeth, and it's very invasive. Huge, huge, huge <laughs> teeth. <Tracks of> land. <laughs> um, it's a very invasive species, and the issue with snakeheads is that um, they pretty much eat anything. And because it is not a natural, uh, it's not a... Um, it's not a native species. A native species, thank you. Uh, it, uh, it's pretty much wiping out the existing fish population, the fish, the fish community, if you will. <laughs> it's terrible. It sounds terrible. <laughs> what really makes these fish scary... The fish community! <laughs> ...is that um, they will actually crawl if, if they don't like where they are they will crawl out of the pond yes! and crawl to another one they have actually seen them crawling across the road to a, a pond on the other side of the road i don't know if i like that i don't care i for like that at fish all. very much fish are nice but once they start like <laughs> no Mm-mm. no no thank you sir these guys have huge teeth too just They'll muckle right on to you, as we say in Maine. They'll muckle. They're mucklefish. Mucklers. They're mucklers from way back. The um, days of yore. From the days of yore. That's when they started muckling. That's when the pro expert fisherman tour began, actually. So they're With pretty, a focus in muckling. They're pretty ugly. And uh, these particular snakeheads were We don't nor- body shame. Northern snakeheads. And they can they can consume prey up to thirty three percent larger than them, so they can wow they can plow right through a cod in no time. I feel like that's a joke or no no a euphemism or it sounded like a euphemism. That's why I smirked because after I said it, it just sounded filthy. Plow know? through a cod in no time. You know what I mean. <laughs> So they eat a lot of stuff, and, yeah. and then when they're done eating everything in the pond, they get out and they crawl around, and, and they eat another pond full of fish community. That is terrifying. Yep. That is terrifying. So two years after this initial discovery, northern snakeheads, snakeheads starting, started popping up all over Maryland and the Washington, D.C. area. Okay. They, um, they were actually uh, were, were seen uh, spotted in uh, right outside Philadelphia as well, so they started spreading. And they started just um, wiping out the local fish community. It's terrible. Yeah. There is uh, now the um, Potomac is dirty. Well, in full of snakeheads now. Oh. They, they were really trying to keep the snakeheads out of the Potomac because once they're in the Potomac. Gentrification. Forget about it. Sure. Uh, fish have popped up in the Potomac, also in uh, several other places in the U.S. In 97, one was caught in Southern California in a lake out there. Ooh. He was in a lake. He wasn't like driving around. He wasn't like Where's Hollywood in a VW Boulevard? bus. I need a picture of me and like that guy in the, in the Superman outfit. <laughs> like um, on one of those bus tours. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so this past, Finn. <laughs> this past April, another angler caught a very feisty northern snakehead in Pine Lake 
in uh, Wheaton, Maryland. Uh, local officials drained the lake. They found no more snakeheads. But then another one popped up, kind of like whack-a-mole. You know, they just show yeah. up in these ponds. And we're talking about ponds in the city, like behind strip malls. Yeah. Get their nails done. Sure. I totally get it. Yep, yep. Pick up a, uh, a discounted Ralph Lauren t-shirt. <laughs> Hit up a cigar shopper. Yep. Um, anyway, the Potomac <laughs> is starting to uh, really become a changed river since, uh, since all of these uh, fish have been showing up there. Sure. And um, we've had a couple of incidents, not violent attacks, by snakeheads, but attacks nonetheless. This I feel like if they're crossing the land to get to you, it's a violent attack. <laughs> it's intentional. They're like, ah. I, I think when they're out of water, they're a little more passive. Oh, okay. They're just trying to get to the next thing of water. Sure. Just trying to get by, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just driving my VW bus. There was a, uh, a I think it was a, a young family. They were uh, kayaking in the Potomac, and a uh, 13 year old girl was. Uh, dragging her hand in the water and as she was doing this she saw like this shiny flashing in the water and about two seconds later a snake had lunged at her ah! didn't get her okay scared the shit out of her i would sure think. i'm sure but uh did not she did not get, get some her. new culottes on that girl yeah, yeah yeah but you know surprisingly snake heads aren't um the most dangerous fish in the Potomac or, or really in, uh, in, in lots of different bodies of water around the world. I know. I, I was actually surprised the other day I came into the bedroom and you were watching a murder fish show, yeah, yeah. which I thought was really interesting. River monsters. I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know you had an interest in murder fish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the tiger fish. That's a mean ass fish, but you know what? Catfish. Yeah, no, I've seen that show too. Catfish. It is terrible what people do when they pretend to be someone and then they're dating online for like months at a time. And then if you find out it's not even that person, it's ridiculous. It's a different catfish. I'm talking about the members of the fish community. The, oh, that makes more sense. The, the catfish fish community. Yep. Now, the snakeheads aren't big enough to eat people, but catfish are. There are catfish in other parts of the world that are big enough to eat an adult. For example, after cooling off from the summer heat in one of Berlin's many lakes, a young German woman um, now has a 17 centimeter, that 6.7 inch bite mark on her arm. Um, local animal experts suspect it was a giant catfish Ooh. that lies beneath the surface and attacks swimmers. They're trying to avoid the lake now, which I sure. would. I mean, unless you're noodling. Why do people do that? I don't know. Hillbilly hand fishing? See, that sounds like a euphemism, <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. It sure does. Yeah, yeah. Like, whoa, that's uh, too many knuckles. Here, <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here is uh, the description of what happened. Okay. Quote, we were in the water, just swimming about, and uh, she was telling a, G a German TV station this. When my I, I have a quick question. You yeah. said like a person eating catfish, like a yeah. like a human. And of course, we're a, we're a varied people. So was it like a snooky sized person or like a Dwayne the Rock Johnson sized person? It was an adult woman. I mean, again, yeah, snooky China. I don't know. I don't have a picture of her. China, the professional wrestler. Of she course, was, I'm referring was, to. <laughs> she was German, if that helps. It does not. Okay, it's, it's the only thing I know about her. Okay. Anyway, I, uh, she said, I felt something. And my friend said, I felt it too. And that's when it latched onto my leg and it felt like a bite. We bolted away and then I started bleeding. She was swimming in um, a lake, one of the many small lakes uh, near Berlin when uh, this incident happened. Now, she was taken to the hospital. She was treated. She was okay. But it wasn't like holding on to her leg while she was running away. Like... <laughs> No, but they estimated by the size of the bite that uh, this fish was probably 7.8 feet long. Uh, okay. Huge. That's a person size. Yep. That's a person. It is a person. That's larger than I am. Yes. This species. I mean, it wouldn't outweigh me. This We could still <laughs> wrestle like in the same. Fish wrestling? Is yeah. That what you're, we'd still okay. be in the same yep. wrestling category. Category. You'd be yeah. like a, a bantamweight. I think. I I don't know the weight categories. Anyway. I know I'm not a featherweight. The 
<laughs> According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, this particular type of catfish species can reach a length of 4.5 meters or 15 feet. What? And weigh over... Scheisser, am I right? 300 kilograms or six point, or rather 660 pounds. Holy sh... Yeah. My keys. I know. This... These attacks have happened on a fairly regular basis, and but again, they, no no record of any German bathers being swallowed whole. Okay. Which and is so it, this was in Germany? Yes, this was in Germany. Nine. That's me. Uh, that's all of my German. Wait, no. Brachen. Bratwurst. I know that You're word. You're doing great. Thank you. Le le leche? No. Shit. Then... There is this case. Kase. A body was found inside a giant catfish in Russia. Jeez. Some dispute uh, this having actually happened. Okay. But um, there are several eyewitnesses and some photographs. Um, we're not. They're not really sure if the victim was drowned and was swallowed or was swallowed whole. Did he drown first or did the catfish swallow him while he was just paddling about <laughs> oh yeah that's, that's a terrifying concept yeah that you're just like do to do to do and then what was the thing we were watching the other day where the oh it was it was it chapter two never mind <laughs> that so, wasn't a fish so um are catfish developing a taste for human flesh the answer appears to be yes Yes, they are. Ancient fish theorists say yes. In the in the Kali River of India, a number of human bodies have <laughs> been. Uh, they dispose of them after funeral rites, right? In in the river, and the catfish will eat them. These are dead bodies, sure. But because there is a plentiful supply of dead yeah. bodies, this particular band of catfish, this catfish gang, if you will, um, have developed a taste for human flesh. A couple of guys were fishing near Otter's Confluence in the Bober River in the Czech Republic on the 6th of April of last year. They made an astonishing catch, a gigantic Wells catfish. This thing measured 12 feet long. Ooh, uh, it weighed 413 pounds. Oh, my God. Um, they, were, of course, were pretty joyous because this is a record uh, record setting catch they this was a competitive catfish catch oh it, well you know how i love an alliteration yes which is why i said that Thank you. um so they they pull this catfish out and they take it to be taxidermied and when they opened up the animal's belly they found a large quantity of half digested fish Old metal, an old metal insignia dating back to Nazi Germany, oh. as well of, as as dozens of bone <laughs> fragments. Oh my God! The two fishermen rapidly contacted the police. Right. And they opened up an investigation to determine what what was going on there. Uh, the bones, the the uh, examination of the bones enabled the authorities to determine that they belonged to a Caucasian man in his early twenties who died decades ago i don't know how i forgot about this part of the story yeah. the biologist who examined the fish <laughs> but you're their, blowing my mind again for the first part confirmed that this enormous specimen was probably between 90 and 110 years old i cannot believe this one of the oldest catfish specimens ever caught further analysis of the artifacts and the bones revealed that they had indeed been ingested by the fish probably in the 1940s and were very likely the remains of a German SS officer killed during the occupation of Poland. The team of forensic experts who conducted the tests couldn't determine, however, if the man had actually been killed by the catfish or if he was if he died, he was killed and fell in the river and was I vote eaten. killed by the fish. Okay. Because I think that's like... Just a really wonderful story. Yeah, like <laughs> it is a wonderful story. Just a ah, Nazi doing my thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, nope. They didn't have catfish. The, they didn't have the full skeleton, and then of course, all the rest of him was digested and expelled. So catfish poop. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the story. What I'm telling you is, 
a catfish ate a Nazi and shit him out. So <laughs> we all want to hear that nowadays, that's, don't we? You know, I that's mean, what Nazis need. Yeah. <sighs> catfish ate a Nazi. I love it. And shit him out. I love it. Fuck Nazis. <sighs> It's a good time. That was wonderful. Ooh. Thank you. Oh, I got pictures. I need to show you pictures. Oh, Holy yes, crap. please. Here we go. All right. Here is the picture of the giant catfish. That is one big ass fish. I don't even understand. Like, what is the, sh- the shape of it? Doesn't make any sense. It's huge. <sighs> Here's a picture of the bone fragments. Yeah. The, <laughs> and I'm enjoying this too much. Here is a picture of the Nazi insignia. This blows my mind. Yeah. So there you go. I don't know how I forgot about that part of the story. That's the best I part. I may have been drinking a lot in DC. <laughs> well, is, I think wow. there are a lot of people drinking a lot in DC. Yeah. Well, this. <laughs> This yeah. is a good point. Huh? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Here's Richard Cheese. Thanks for listening to the Box of Oddities. Now it's time for intermission. So won't you please stretch your legs and have a smoke. Buy some snacks and drinks. Or use the toilets and wash your hands in those bathroom sinks. However, if you're not attending the live show right now, this doesn't apply to you and you can pee wherever we don't care when or how. But nonetheless, the larger point I'm making is just this. It's intermission and we'll be back as soon as everyone takes a piss. Piss! What's up, freaks? Are you ready for the strange, the bizarre, the unexpected? Cat and Jethro Gilligan talk. Tell the oddest stories to your ears unprotected. Stories of pugs and their snorties. How weird. And the poop chart. Okay, that's actually pretty weird. Any hoozle. Thank you listeners for being with us here As we lift the lid and cautiously peer Inside the box of oddities It's sometimes dark and morbid But full of quality So let's lift the lid and cautiously peer Inside the box of oddities Why is cats laugh so infectious? And why do Cat and Jethro live next to Stephen King? And many more mysteries that are so super weird Thank you listeners for sticking with us here As we lift the lid and cautiously peer Inside the box of oddities It's sometimes dark and morbid full of quality
And now, the Box of Oddities brings you that thing in the middle. Things you never knew about the curator. Number six. When I go to the grocery store and place things in my shopping cart, I like to give those things individual names. And I talk to them on the way home, and I, I tell them what life is going to be like in my house. Number five. I have a mole somewhere on my body in the shape of the state of Arizona. I like to call it my little Grand Canyon. Number four. My favorite Disney character is Pluto because he's Mickey's best friend. Number three. I once ran 18 miles of a 26-mile marathon, having eaten only a light dinner the night before with three martinis. I couldn't walk for days. Number two, if you'd like to send me KFC gift cards, well, I wouldn't turn them down. And finally, the number one thing you don't know about the curator. Now that you see what, what my little booth looks like, what my house looks like. I'd love to see yours. The Box of Oddities with Cat and Jethro Gilligan-Toth. Hey, I forgot my hat. I forgot my shoes. Oh my gosh. You're not wearing shoes? No. I'm not going to wear shoes either. Screw that. Fuck shoes, I say. <gasps> Gross. That is, I mean, I'm not kink shaming or anything, you're, but you're for shaming. private time. Okay, good point. For private time. Um, speaking of which, uh, big thanks to uh, Elysian. Is that how we've agreed that? Elysian. We, we, Elysian? Yeah. Uh, Space Dust IPA mm-hmm. for uh, providing me with delicious beverage tonight. And this is a local main microbrew uh, from Lyman, Maine, actually, Funky Bow. Which I like very yeah, much. It's really good. Anyway, what you got for me? Oh, yeah, it's that time. Here we go. Entertain me. Okay. So, this is the story that I compiled for our San Francisco show, um, which, by the way, was a blast. Um, we're getting comfortable. We're getting comfortable. All right. Um, so I did start off the story with a little bit of <laughs> history about San Francisco. Uh, went back to the earliest archaeological evidence uh, of the city, which dates to about 3000 BCE, by the way. In case you're curious, it's uh, just a little bit of archaeological uh, history for you. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but in March of 1776, the Spanish established the Prodesto of San Francisco, and the area became a part of Mexico upon independence from Spain, 1821. I went through some history stuff because we were in San Francisco, but right now we're in our basement, so I'm going to zip right past some of this. <laughs> shoot, shoot, Most shoot. of that was just to shoot. please the local audience. Yeah, it's kind of like when you go to, let's say, uh, any club club and go you guys like to get high <laughs> huh all right because yeah. then they're automatically in the habit of agreeing with you and you you're, you're, you're setting a precedent that's right is what you're doing you're getting them yeah. to say yes at the beginning um so you guys like to get high all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay it was not until though 1859 that the united states got their first Emperor Joshua Abram Norton, better known as Emperor Norton. He had his own currency. He made nation altering proclamations, some of which turned out to be kind of premonitory. And law enforcement saluted him on the street. Who is he? Okay, so Norton was born in England, but spent most of his early life in South Africa. He sailed west after the death of his mother in 1846 and his father in 1848, arriving in San Francisco during the heady days of the 1849 gold rush. 
Now, this was a guy that uh, kind of um, invented his own identity, if I recall from your story, correct? I, I think most people do. Well, <laughs> that's an excellent point. If you don't like who you are, be somebody else. Yeah. That's our advice. Good night. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Okay, so, sorry. All right. <clears throat> what were we saying? Yes. Norton dove into real estate, and in the early 1850s, he turned his original $40,000 investment into a quarter million dollar fortune. At that time, you know, consider that's, a, that's big money. He did it in real estate? Yeah. Wow. In December 1852, China responded to a famine by placing a ban on the export of rice to other countries. And this caused the price of rice to skyrocket, especially in San Francisco. So after hearing of a shipment returning to California from Peru carrying 200,000 pounds of rice, Joshua Norton attempted to corner the rice market, which I think is what we're all trying to do in the end, <laughs> yeah. is just control rice. I think that cornering the rice market sounds like a euphemism. Really, anything can sound like a euphemism. <laughs> Grandma's you, chicken salad. If you just go at the end of it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I like it. I'm just trying to figure out, like, what act would that... I can't parallel park, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'd like to victor her, Victoria, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I don't know. All right, so, um, <clears throat> shortly after he purchased the entire shipment of rice... Several other ships from Peru arrived filled with rice, and the, the price plummeted. It did not work out. It was an investment that, that, that didn't pan. Now he just had this giant boat of rice, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, I Is love where, a nice curry dish, so sure. I'm into it. Is that where rice aroni, the San Francisco treat, came from? It may be. Wow. I'm going to look into that. Interesting. Hold on. No, no, later. We have to... There are people watching. Okay. Hi. Hopefully. Uh, thanks for joining us. Okay. So um, after several years of litigation, the Supreme Court said, you have to pay Peru for that shipload of rice that you, you I mean, you asked them to buy it, please. So uh, it's kind of your deal. Uh, go ahead. So then he disappeared for a time because he owed a lot of money and sure. he couldn't, you know, he was sad. Of course he was. He was sad and he had a lot of rice. <laughs> who among us can deny that that is something we've all we, been to college we've all we had those days where we were sad. we're sad and all we had was rice and ramen maybe mac and cheese when it was three for a dollar so i have to say recently i've been buying ramen and i have like hard boil an egg put a little fresh jalapeno a little fresh kale in there it's like a whole new dish I'm saying it costs two dollars. Yeah, we're gonna start a new podcast called "Pimp Your Ramen." Yes, this is actually a euphemism. It's a great idea. It's a euphemism. What? Yeah. What does that even mean? I'm gonna pimp my ramen, if you know what I mean. All right. So when Norton reemerged, focus. Sorry. When Norton reemerged, he did so with spectacular flair. Okay. So how did he become emperor? Newspapers helped. On September 17th, 1859, he distributed letters to newspapers around the city of San Francisco. This comes from thoughtco.com. The San Francisco Bulletin indulged his claims and printed the statement. As the presumptory request and desire of a large majority majority Ms. of Ms. citizens. Majority, that's majority. a, that's a uh, metric term. Mm. My falsies slipped. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these United States, <laughs> and in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the union to assemble in musical hall of this city on the first day of February next, and then will make such alterations to the existing laws of the union. He talked fancy. I mean, it just makes sense. 
I, now that I'm the emperor, we're all going to get together. Louisiana, get your ass over here. Let's, <laughs> come on. Uh, we're all going to meet at Music Hall, and we're going we're gonna to figure this shit out, right? State's got some problems. We're going to figure it out right here at Music Hall. <clears throat> and there's rice for everybody. <laughs> I have some left over. Uh, <laughs> so he dressed the part. He wanted to be emperor. He claimed he was emperor. He didn't fuck around. Did he have a hat with a feather? You know, we did. God, I want a hat with a feather. Also, donning an epaulette adorned navy coat and an ostrich feather plumed hat, he would occasionally carry a military saber. He spent his days either in the library, reading or drafting a number of decrees and proclamations. Of course. That's what an emperor does. Of course. His first act of emperor was to abolish Congress. <laughs> I think we can all get on board with that, right? It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on. Let's abolish Congress. <laughs> It is uh, re represented to us that the universal suffrage, as now existing through the Union, is abused, he said. That fraud and corruption prevent a fair and proper expression of the public voice. Right. I mean, we, we feel this, right? We feel this. Um, so he thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to write up something and just be done with it. Therefore, he wrote, Congress is abolished. When Congress stubbornly refused to be abolished, Emperor Norton ordered the army to forcefully clear Congress from the Capitol. Did the, he have an army? He just meant the army. Oh, okay. Like the army. The army. Yeah. The United States Army. They did not appear to hmm. obey his particular royal directions. That must have rankled the emperor. It, it rankled indeed. Rankling the emperor again. If you know what I mean. I feel like rankling the emperor, <laughs> right? No. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Where were we? Yes. We were rankling the emperor. Some efforts saw more movement than others. Okay. So the emperor saw fit to decree three times in 1872 that a suspension bridge be constructed to connect Oakland with San Francisco. In the third of these decrees in September of 1872... Norton, frustrated that no one was building this friggin' bridge that he had obviously stated should be built, ordered that the citizens of San Francisco and Oakland appropriate funds for the survey of the bridge and uh, for a tunnel and to ascertain uh, which is the best project. So he, he, I mean, he wanted their input, but he also was like, "This is, guys, this should happen, right? Um, and, I mean, in... 1933 construction of a complex of bridges spanning San Francisco Bay in California was started. So, I mean, he was he was not wrong. He was ahead of his time in many ways. He certainly was. Going all the way back to the abolishing Congress thing. <laughs> so, Norton cast himself as a social justice warrior concerned with the problems facing the subjects of the empire. Of course, he's emperor, so he's got to he's got to take care of his flock. You know, uh, in the Wait a early minute. emperors have flocks. I think so. Okay, I didn't realize that. That's interesting. Who who doesn't have a flock? I don't have a flock. You have a flock. No, no, no I'm flockless. I would say we're your flock. Oh, flock off. <laughs> so. In the 1870s, he called for desegregation of public schools, standing up for Chinese immigrants, promoting religious tolerance, or advocating for women's voting rights. Ooh. He was very concerned that all the people in his region have the same rights. It was very important to him. Norton became a cherished mascot for the city of San Francisco. Photos of him in imperial dress were very popular souvenirs, and Emperor Norton dolls found their way into shops Wait, across the city. This was the mid 1800s, and he had his own action figure. That's right. God, he was way ahead. Yeah, GI Emperor Norton. <laughs> Uh, while he was tootling about the city, he was often accompanied by Bummer and Lazarus. <laughs> <laughs> who were two stray dogs that roamed the streets of San Francisco uh, in the early 1860s. <laughs> now, 
Were they his dogs or did he just kind no. of, <clears throat> they just followed him about? They were street dogs recognized for their unique bond and rat killing ability. Wow. They did, he, were, did Emperor Norton name them? No. Mama and Lazarus? No. no these were names they that were, were bestowed. They were street dogs. Okay. Right. That just really attached themselves to him. That must, and he them. Must have been a fun time to this be alive. a beautiful rat killing bond that they had. <laughs> I love rats, so this kind of makes me sad actually. Um, but <laughs> they became a fixture of the city and they were exempted from local ordinances and immortalized in cartoons. Really? So during the Emperor Norton's tootling about his city, he would make inspections. He would examine the condition of sidewalks and cable cars. And the, he would then state the repair of public property and the appearance to public officers. So he would find policemen. He would say, you know, that fire hydrant uh, isn't as it should be. we got to get that repainted. Mm -hmm. And they'd be like, okay, we're going to get right on that. Is that how they talked back in the 1800s in San Francisco? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Interesting. So in 1867, Emperor Norton was taken into custody. Apparently, a policeman or a security guard, there is some disagreement as to which he was, arrested Emperor Norton for vagrancy and committed him to treatment for a mental disorder. Unreal, right? <laughs> So he had some issues with the police. Uh, people were pissed. San Francisco was in an uproar. According to one writer, since he has worn the imperial purple, he has shed no blood, <laughs> robbed nobody, and despoiled the country of no one, which is more than can be said of his fellow citizens Ooh. in that line. The San Francisco police chief, Patrick Crowley, ordered Norton released and issued a formal apology from the police force. I love this. The emperor granted a pardon to the policeman who arrested him. Oh. He, was, he was a gentle and gracious emperor, and he said, no, no, guys, I totally get how you could have been confused. I don't get it. <laughs> steady rice of, uh, A steady diet of rice will do that. Really? Yeah. That'll just make you kind and, sure. and gentle? Yeah. All right. So um, he <laughs> he said that uh, the policeman should be forgiven and that all uh, from then on, the police chief stated that all police officers in the city should salute Emperor oh, Norton. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I, I forgot about that, that part of your story. Oh, it was serious. serious. Saluting the, the emperor. city loved. If you him. know what I mean. Sorry. It's a bit much. Yeah, okay. I've overdone it. No, it's it. great. You're doing great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> it's a character I'm developing called Creepy Drinking Guy. Creepy Drinking Guy. Creepy Drinking Guy. Goes I've like seen this. it before. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's great. It's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorites. So San Francisco loves Emperor Norton. He frequently ate for free in the city's best restaurants. Seats were reserved for him at the openings of plays and concerts. He issued his own currency to pay for debts, <laughs> which stores accepted across the city. That's wonderful. Just made it. Just made it. Gave it out. They were like, this is great. We will accept this. This is dollars. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> in August of 1870, Norton was listed by the census taker with the occupation of emperor, living at 624 Commercial Street. Why didn't we go there when we were in San Francisco? Because we're idiots. We should have gone to 624 Central Street and paid homage to Commercial the Street. Commercial Are you Street. Are not listening to me? What? <laughs> so, unfortunately, as we all do... In 1880, Emperor Norton collapsed in front of Old St. Mary's Cathedral. I mean, we don't all collapse in front of Old St. Mary's Cathedral, well, but you know should, what I'm getting we to. We should all be so lucky. Although every effort was made to get Emperor Norton to the nearest hospital, he did pass away. 
How old was he? I don't know. I'd have to do the math, and that's too much to ask of me at this point. I understand. Okay. A search of Norton's boarding house room after his death confirmed that he was living in poverty, even though he could make his own money. He had approximately five um, U.S. dollars on his person when he collapsed, and a gold sovereign worth approximately 250 was found in his room. Among his personal items were a collection of walking sticks, sassy as they were, <laughs> multiple hats and caps, and letters written to Queen Victoria. San Francisco gave Norton a send-off fit for an emperor. The king is dead, read the headline in the Chronicle. He is dead, lamented another paper, and no citizen of San Francisco could have been taken away with more sadness and more greatly missed than Emperor Norton. The first funeral arrangements planned to bury Emperor Norton in a pauper's coffin were shunned. <laughs> Shun. Shunned. Shunned. How a Pacific Club, the San Francisco Businesswoman's uh, Association, elected to pay for a rosewood casket oh, befitting a dignified gentleman. The funeral procession on January 10, 1880, was attended by as many as 30,000 of San Francisco's 230,000 residents. The procession itself was two miles long. What? Norton was buried in the Masonic Cemetery. In 1934, his casket was transferred, along with all other graves, to Woodlawn Cemetery in California. Just going to give you a moment to think about that. California. Mm. California. Likes to Here party. Come. Oh, we want with different songs. Mm, it happens. Interesting. I bit my mm. tongue. Approximately 60,000 people attended the new installment of his grave. Flags across the city flew at half mast. And the inscription on the new tombstone read, Norden I, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico. The 200th birthday of His Imperial Majesty, Norden I, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, was held last year. And San Francisco City Hall was lit in gold to honor him. In an interview about his birthday, Joseph Master, a celebrator dressed as the emperor, stated, this is a city that appreciates people who are different. So they had an Emperor Norden impersonator. Yes. That's how big he was. Oh, yeah. Wow. And an Emperor Norton celebration day. This is a city that appreciates people who are different, he said, and that people can come here and reinvent themselves in that is a spirit that continues to run through our city. Mm. And that's what San Francisco is all about. I love that. I love it, too. That's Emperor Norton. I remember you saying this in uh, the original telling of the story in San Francisco. I don't remember anything about that day. Uh, it was Cobb's Comedy Nightclub. Uh, down on the waterfront. I played an arcade game. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and I it, had a bunch of drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was San Francisco. Sure. Um, but you said that uh, he declared all these different laws, and one of them was you had to pay a fine of like 25 bucks if you used the term Frisco. Yes, Frisco was not allowed in his book. He was not having it. It's San Francisco. Don't Fuck around with the name of his city. The emperor was not having it. When, when you said that at the live show in San Francisco, the audience went crazy. They were like, yes, we fucking hate that when people say Frisco. Yeah. So don't say Frisco. Don't say Frisco. No. no. The emperor wave his finger at you. Yes. Yes, he would. If you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, we're going to do a uh, virtual meet and greet on yeah, Zoom. like a Zoom meeting. Right after this. And there's the link. You can join us and we, we will answer all your questions. It'll be, well, we'll answer some of them. We'll have a tip jar as well if you feel like partaking in that kind of business. No pressure. Yeah, we, uh, we appreciate it though. But in, in lieu of the question and answers here, I thought it would be fun to show... Uh, the freaks, some of the wonderful stuff that people have brought to us during live shows Yay! or mailed to us. Um, 
I had some stuff here yeah, somewhere. Yeah, it's over there. Oh, okay. Hang on. I'll yeah. get it. Yeah. You can go and get it. In the meantime, I'll talk about rice. So, oh, here's a hypodermic needle that uh, someone gave to us. I think they found it in like their dad's old doctor office. It is made of glass and it was terrifying to get through uh, security at the airport. Yeah, it was a real issue. Uh, we've had several cross stitches made for us. This one's pretty cool. It's William Banjo. We love that one. This one as well. Oh, uh, what you got for me? So cute. Thank you so much. Love the cross stitch. Uh, probably my favorite thing that's ever been done is coming for your dick. Rawr. Hold on. Coming for your dick. Rawr. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little see-through. My favorite is um, this particular wet specimen. Um, it's a snake through a raccoon heart, I think. Yeah, it's a snake in a raccoon's heart that somebody brought to us uh, during the DC show, mm -hmm. I think. And we, so we didn't know how to travel home no. with it. So we sent it home with Amber. Yeah. We let her deal with TSA on that one. Yeah. And uh, she'll answer all your questions about that during the, uh, the meet and greet uh, as well. Uh, we loved doing this. We will do it again sometime. And yeah. maybe next time what we'll do is prepare. We will, yeah. Well, we'll prepare. Yeah. Number one, number two, we'll eat plenty of rice. Absolutely. And number three, we will, uh, perhaps take you across the hall and show you the box of oddities studio where we yeah, do our, that's where we thing. do the show. Yeah. It's currently very messy. Yes, it is. There's grout. We look forward to seeing you guys next time until then. Keep flying that freak flag. Fly it proudly. You beautiful freak. Beautiful freak.